we simply cannot allow people to pour into the United States undetected, undocumented, unchecked. And complete the dang fence. This bill that we will sign today is not a revolutionary bill. Cast down your bucket where you are. We come from France. And I am, you know, adamantly against illegal immigrants. They're coming in by the thousands, just unbelievable. A Deal. wall is an immorality. What are you rooting for? Those masters of the universe are at it again. You maniac! You blew it up! Welcome to Parsing Immigration Policy, the podcast of the Center for Immigration Studies. My name is Mark Krikorian, Executive Director of the Center. And this week, we have a longtime observer of immigration on the show. Joe Gazzardi has been writing about immigration for many years. He writes currently for Project for Immigration Reform, but also has a syndicated column. But he's been writing about this for a long time was introduced to the immigration issue as a teacher, interestingly enough, out in California, which is not where he lives now. And I just thought, given the the length of time he's been writing on this issue and kind of marinated, as it were, in immigration, uh, I don't know, maybe almost as long as I've been doing it, I thought it would be interesting to have him on the show. So, Joe, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mark, for having me on. And I love your description of having been marinated. <laughs> right. In immigration, I've got a 35-year history of observing and writing about immigration, and it's been fascinating, it's been frustrating, it's now and then been rewarding. But I came to the immigration issue stone cold. I mean, I didn't know anything about immigration. My background was in finance. I was a banker in New York. Got tired of that, moved out to Seattle, knocked around there for a little bit, and then I moved back to California. I'm a California native, but I moved back to Lodi in the San Joaquin Valley. I had been born in Los Angeles, but I did not want to return there. So I got down to Lodi. Just to place it for listeners, that's sort of the northern part of the Central Valley of California. Is that correct? Yeah, right. It is exactly right. Yeah. Lodi in the San Joaquin Valley, an immigrant-heavy area. Right. Why'd you end up going there? Why Lodi? Well, I had friends in the valley, and I, as a kid growing up in Los Angeles, my parents often visited their friends in the San Joaquin Valley. So I knew it was a good place. I knew it was sunny. And I had been living in Seattle, so being in a sunny climate sounded pretty good to me. So what did you see there that that sort of tuned you into the immigration issue? Well, I became aware of the job teaching at the Lodi Adult School, teaching English as a second language. Mm-hmm. And the reason I got that job was because the principal was very anxious to get staff on board in anticipation of the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act. Oh, so this is a long time ago. We're talking 35, more than 35 years ago. Yeah. Right. Well, marinating. Yeah, (laughs) right. So he knew that the enrollments were going to be uh, enormous because one of the provisions of the Immigration Reform and Control Act was that to get a green card, the students had to spend 40 classroom hours in English language instruction. Right. Now, today, such a provision would be, I mean, out of a question. There would never be any requirement for a green card that included classroom instruction. But at that time, it did. Interesting. And the classes were packed. And one of the deals was we gave not only English language instruction, but also instruction in civics and history and The students had to put their 40 hours in, and then at the end of the 40 hours, after they'd satisfied that requirement, then they got what I guess you would call an oral exam. Right. So I would be in the small room with them, asking them questions in English that involved either basic conversation skills or required them to demonstrate some knowledge of government. Right. So this was, just to clarify for listeners, this was the big 1986 amnesty. 
Yeah. And so these were the hoops that the illegal immigrants had to jump through in order to get their green cards. And one of them is, like you said, these English and civics tests, almost like the test you have to take to become a citizen, but they were sort of requiring the same kind of instruction in order to stop being an illegal alien and get a green card. That's exactly right. So it was really during the oral exam that the rubber met the road because some of the students had been living in the United States a long time and could speak English perfectly well, and they just wanted to get their 40 hours in and get on the way. But a lot of students had been living in the United States for a long time and couldn't speak any English, even after 40 hours, which, if you don't know a language, 40 hours is not going right. to be enough time to get you familiar with that language. Heck, I took French for three years, and <laughs> all I can do is ask where the bathroom is. Yeah, exactly. So there was a form that the instructor was supposed to sign to attest to the fact that the student had spent the required 40 hours and that they could pass this simple conversational test. Right. And I didn't sign it. If they couldn't speak in English, I didn't sign it. Sure. And, you know, remember, I'm brand new. And what was in front of me was a federal form that required me to attest to the fact that they could speak English. And, right. you know, I felt, well, if I sign it, I'm falsifying this form. Right. So I didn't sign a few of them. And then one day, one day I got a phone call. Uh, the office staff called me in and said, oh, there's somebody on the phone from Immigration and Naturalization <laughs> Services that would like to talk to you. So the old INS, in other words, is calling you Yeah, up. INS. So this guy says, it's come to my attention that you're not signing the students' forms. <laughs> And I said, well, I'm not signing the forms for the best possible reason. They are not meeting the requirements. And the guy said, look, just sign the form. <laughs> just sign them and, you know, get them out of there. So that was my first insight. Wow. Into, you know, maybe things are not always exactly as they should be. Sort of opened my eyes. But on the whole, the classes were very crowded extremely crowded. A lot of people came. Right. A lot of people eventually got their 40 hours in, although some of it was piecemeal, you know, two hours here, a week later, another two hours. Interesting. That, that kind of thing. So the, the focus was really getting, getting the hours in so that they could get the green card and not on learning English. So, I mean, that really does shed some light on all of the promises in congressional debates about amnesty when we had that big several years of debate under the George W. Bush administration about a new amnesty and then the Gang of Eight amnesty debate under Obama about all the guarantees the supporters were giving us. Well, you know, they're definitely going to meet X, Y, and Z requirements and we're putting all of these tough requirements in the bill. And yet, right. and, that, and that was one of the arguments for the 86 amnesty was that it's going to have these tough requirements and, you know, on a whole bunch of things, including this English language and civics issue, which frankly, you know, theoretically, if you're going to do something like that, it's not a bad idea. But what you're describing is what actually ends up happening, which is that there's pressure just to move things along in the same way as during that same amnesty, the farm worker portion of it, there are all kinds of people who lied about being farm workers. And basically the immigration officers were told, you know, just sign the form, you know, just do it. Stop complaining. Stop trying to take our guarantees and our commitments seriously. Just sign the darn thing so we can amnesty these people. That's right. And I knew when I was reading about the Bush amnesty and I guess the Obama amnesty too, that there were going to be these rigorous language requirements. I, of course, knew that was complete nonsense because right. I had been through it all before, and I couldn't see any way that it would be any better than it had been in 1986. So so did you start writing about it then? I mean, were you still yeah, well, teaching these classes while you were writing? Well, you know, each day as an instructor, my eyes became further opened <laughs> to the realities of immigration. And, and what happened was 
The largest newspaper in in the area was the Stockton Record. Stockton right. being just south of Lodi by about ten miles, and the the editor of the paper said, "Well, you know, I think it would be a great idea if we had some local people write weekly editorials." Right. So he asked for submissions, and in the end, there was a Hispanic writer and an Asian contributor and a black contributor, and me. Right. And I started to write about my classroom experiences. And at that time, I'm quite sure that there wasn't any real serious critical coverage of immigration. I mean, throughout California, there was maybe one or two reporters. There was a guy at the Sacramento Bee, Dan Walters. Yeah, I remember him. He did a yeah. pretty good job. But anyway, so that's how I got started with the column writing, which in turn led to a phone call from the people up at Californians for Population Stabilization. They were also headquartered in Sacramento at the time. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, why don't you come up here and let's talk? And that phone call from CAPS led to my involvement as an activist, you know, as an immigration enforcement activist. That was step one. As my Lodi Adult School career continued on, there became another class ESL segment, which was for Southeast Asian war refugees. Okay. And that was mandatory if they wanted to keep receiving welfare benefits. Oh, interesting. So, I mean, but this is long after the Vietnam War was over. I mean, this is more than 10 years afterwards. Yeah, yeah, it was long after the war was over. Big 90s? Right. Possibly tied into the illegal immigration reform. I see. Yeah, the welfare reform and the the welfare portions of the immigration law in 96. There I was, again, teaching English as, as a second language, but this was... Really an amazing experience, Mark, but where the classrooms were packed, and, and in the rooms we had Cambodian students, Vietnamese students, Laotian students, Hmong students, right. and here these war refugees are who had not that long ago maybe been in a refugee camp or living in uh, huts in Vietnam. Right. And now they're in downtown Stockton, California, in an ESL class, basically trying to get by. Right. So I would listen to them talk about their war experiences, and it was it was just amazing. And a lot of the students did their best, you know, tried their best, but a lot of them just couldn't really adjust you know, to that that tremendous transition from how their lives were before to how their lives were today. And at that time in Stockton, assimilation or the lack of assimilation was a really huge problem. There were gangs, there were drive-by shootings, there were home invasions, Mm -hmm. and it was just a tough place for these refugees to have to adjust. Right. But anyway, they were required to come to class to maintain their their welfare benefits. And some did and, and some didn't. And what I said to all of my English as a second language students, whether they were part of the uh, Spanish-speaking group that was in pursuit of a green card or whether they, they were the Asians that were... Uh, trying to just maintain their benefits, I said, look, you are going to live in the United States much longer than you ever lived in Mexico or, or Vietnam or, right. or Laos. If you can learn to speak English, your life will just be better. You right. will, you'll be able to get more out of your American life than if you just continue to stay in your little circle of friends and in your local communities where you're speaking your native languages back and forth to each other. Right. And I hope that that was influential. And I think in some cases it was, but 
I would have liked to come away thinking that it, that encouragement made more of an impact in it than it might have. So, you know, a question I had is because I used to teach citizenship classes for these are people with green cards who either had a date for this naturalization test or they wanted to see what it was like before they, you know, took the plunge and you, you have to spend a lot of money in the application. So anyway, the point is these were all legal immigrants by definition. And so this was at Catholic Charities in Northern Virginia. And, you know, it was basic stuff. The hundred questions for naturalization are published online. The answers are there and they only pick from those hundred questions. So it's not that hard. And we went over, you know, the usual stuff. Lincoln freed the slaves. The Atlantic Ocean is on the East Coast. It's basic stuff, but it's important that they learn that. When the Washington Post did a profile of me, they mentioned this. And even though the guy that I dealt with at Catholic Charities knew what I did for a living, but politics never came up. Immigration policy never came up. You know, it's just like I said, it's who's the father of our country and, you know, what is the First Amendment kind of material. I was fired the same day it came out. I was like, we can't have you in here teaching. I remember. I mean, that's sort of the wind up for the question is, how did you keep this, you know, job while you were writing columns about immigration enforcement and the problems that the uncontrolled immigration can cause? I was so lucky. I mean, you are 100% right. I could not have remained on the staff of the Lodi Unified School District writing these columns if I were doing that today. There's no question. Interesting. What helped me out was, first of all, the principal of the adult school. And, you know, adult school is kind of outside of the mainstream right. of the bureaucracy in the school district. So. It's a subsection, really, of the school district. But the adult school principal was 100% on our side. You know, he would say, hey, great column. You made some good points. And the school superintendent was also on our side, although more quietly. So that, that helped a lot. But what really brought attention to me and my views was when I became a candidate in the 2003 recall Gray Davis election. The candidates, there were about 100 or so of us. Wait, candidates for what, though? What were you, what office? For governor, were? you know. Oh, I see. Oh, that's right. Yeah. So, in other words, there was this long list of 100 people to yeah. vote for. I see. Okay. Instead of Gray Davis, in other words. Right. Right. So, I was on television, you know, in, Interesting. up and down California uh, on the radio. And it was pretty much out there every day. You know, Joe Gazzardi says this about immigration and Joe Gazzardi says that about immigration. And it brought, again, mainly because I had the support of the school principal and of the school superintendent. But I couldn't have done any of that kind of thing in today's atmosphere, which is, I mean, anything that is even suggestive of a criticism of immigration, legal, illegal, and whatever, is is just going to doom you to criticism. And especially if you're a, a school district employee where the enrollment is now probably about 40% immigrant, mostly Hispanic, but right. but other uh, nationalities too. I don't want to slide past the fact that you ran for governor along with 100 other people in the recall election. What possessed you to do that and what what was involved in that? Well, I was possessed to do it because I thought, wow, this is really a great way to get the message out to greater California. I was writing my columns that were published in the Stockton Record and also the Lodi News Sentinel, which were the two major papers in the area, and they they didn't really get much uh, readership beyond the San Joaquin Valley. And I thought, well, here's a chance to do it. And the platform was, hey, there's some things going on in California that you, the residents of the state, and you, the voters, should know about, but you're not being told about. And what I like to talk about most, since I was a school teacher, was, you know, the total enrollment of the California schools is like 6 million people. Mm -hmm. But 
one and a half million of them don't speak any English. And that's a problem. Right. And the school districts throughout the years that I spent as a teacher, every year, the enrollment of non-speaking students was higher. And, you know, by the time I left the school district, most of the schools south of Stockton, you know, when you start talking about Fresno and Modesto and Bakersfield, I mean, they were just essentially totally populated by Hispanics and a lot of them non-English speaking. So I wanted to do the governor thing. And as I say, I got what I thought was very favorable publicity. And it was like a free ride to get your message out there. And what year was that? Remind me, I forget. 2003. Okay. Gray Davis was universally hated. (laughs) I mean, everybody disliked Gray Davis. And it's kind of a mystery how he ever got elected in the first place. But the recall went forward and, you know, Schwarzenegger won the recall. The deal was, the first vote was, should Gray Davis be recalled or not? Right. And that vote went overwhelmingly toward, yes, recall him. And then the rest of the candidates were vying for position to replace him, and and Schwarzenegger won that recall, and then he won the general election. So how did you get on the ballot? How did what, what was that involved? I mean, if there's 100 people, it couldn't have been that difficult. It wasn't difficult. Well, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. You needed to get 90 signatures. And That's it. Jeez. So I was running as a Democrat. Right. At the time, you know, I was kind of <laughs> betwixt and between. Right. So. Well, I'll run as a Democrat. So you had to get 90 signatures, which involved like going out to the parking lot at sure, Safeway of and, yeah. and kind of introducing yourself. And somebody advised me, look, you need 90, and they need to be 90 valid confirmed signatures. Of course. So to be sure you get 90, get 300. <laughs> right, because right. You'll have people who give their wrong names or their wrong dates or they're Republican. And so that... It was time-consuming and kind of tedious because you had to talk to a lot of people for a long time. And sometimes in the end, they said, look, you know, I'm not going to sign. I'm not a political person. and right. I don't really care. So the 90 signatures got you on the ballot. And then I think there was three months or so between the time that the time expired by which you had to be uh, have your signatures in and confirmed. and the date of the election. So all of that time was spent campaigning, if you will, and going out and, uh, you know, spreading the word. I got, not just me, but a lot of the candidates got excellent coverage. I mean, into the, all up and down California, for sure. The Washington papers, USA Today, other major papers covered the election because it was it was an interesting story politically, and it was kind of a human interest story. You know, who sure, are right. these 100 people? Right. And a lot of them, a lot of the candidates were serious people. You know, they had positions on uh, schools or guns or pro-choice. Sure. And in my case, you know, immigration and population, because that was a, a subject that I tied into a lot, too. Some of them were recognizable names. Peter Uberoth, who had been chairman of the Olympic right. Committee out in L.A. There was Tom McClintock, the congressman. Yeah. He, Mark, he was terrible. I mean, he, he just would not talk about immigration at all. Which is ironic because he's become a lot better on immigration. He's now chairman yeah. of the immigration subcommittee in the House. But, so there were serious candidates, and then there were some that were not so serious. There was... Dabney Coleman, that actor, <laughs> actor from yeah. <laughs> Different Strokes, right. and there was Larry Flint, <laughs> the, the pornographer, uh, yeah. and the best one. This is the this is the greatest platform of all time. There was a porn star named Mary Carey, not Mariah Carey, Mary Carey. Okay, and her platform was let's make lap dances <laughs> income tax deductible. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so so anyway, just to finish the election thing, how many votes did you end up getting? Well, I prefer to just say of the 100 candidates, I fell into the middle range, substantially behind Schwarzenegger, <laughs> but not 
not an embarrassment to my campaign. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. So <laughs> where did you go from there? I mean, you don't live in California anymore. You don't do the teaching as far as I know. Sort of what happened after that with regard to your activism on the issue? Well, what happened after the California election was that California started to wear me out. Right. I'm a, a native Californian, born in Los Angeles and born in California at a time when the state's population was 10 million people. Mm -hmm. So we've got photographs in the family album of my parents and my sisters on Santa Monica Beach without a single soul in sight. Wow. And by the time I was done with the immigration campaigning and the school district, it was up to about 35 million people. And right. I was just, California was so different from the state that I grew up in and, and had all of these fond memories of that I, I just, I wanted to get out. So I had attended University of Pittsburgh. I used to come to Pittsburgh on business when I worked for the banks. Right. And I liked it. You know, I have children and grandchildren here, and immigration in Pittsburgh is really not a factor. It's not, there just isn't much immigration in Pittsburgh. I think maybe 2% of the population, right. something like that. So it was just a comfortable move for me to make, coming to a city that I was familiar with and getting away from an area in California that was really changing before my eyes at a very rapid rate. But you still write about immigration now, right? You've been writing oh, yeah, no, columns totally on write it pretty about, consistently, right? Totally right about, about immigration. Oh, if I could just back up sure. for one second to the, to the election. It's a, a very amusing event. And, and as you know, there normally aren't too many amusing things <laughs> that happen to people that are in the middle of the immigration battles. But before election day, Jay Leno invited all of the candidates <laughs> to come down to NBC and be the guests on his show. <laughs> so the show is taped like at four o'clock in the afternoon. So this is the Tonight so Show, right? I mean, this is, you know, Johnny Carson's old show, basically. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. So uh, Leno invited us, uh, Leno's PR department, I guess, invited us to come down there around noon. So about maybe 50 or 75 the candidates were there. We had our tables and our materials and were interacting with each other, shaking hands and, you know, having a pretty good time. Sure. And the show starts and Leno says, well, good evening, fans. Tonight we have some special guests. We've got 75 individuals who are candidates for Gray Davis's job, candidates to be the next California governor. And the rest of the audience is a bunch of illegal aliens <laughs> on their way to DMV to get their driver's license. <laughs> Funny, yeah, great. He, he was good on our stuff. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, did you talk? To, I mean, did Leno actually speak with every one of you guys? No, he didn't speak with all of us. But he did come down. They hosted lunch. We did the little outside thing with the tables, right? And he hosted lunch, which was cafeteria style lunch. It wasn't a big deal. But he came down and, you know, interacted a little bit, shook some hands, and thanked everybody for coming. So it was, no, it was nice, as I yeah. say. It was, uh, if you will, one of the highlights of my 35 years in uh, immigration. Yeah, it's sort of a bucket list thing for a lot of people <laughs> is run for office for something, you know what I mean, without even a realistic... Well, the cool thing about this was that you were actually on the ballot. Right. You know, exactly, I mean, yeah. you, you can go out and campaign and say you're running for United States Senator and you could get nowhere. But in this particular case, <laughs> you were actually on the ballot. Did you ke did you keep a copy of a sample ballot or something just so you, you know, have like it as oh, a clip? I wish I had. Yeah, great. But what I did do and, and everybody who was at the Leno event did it. You know, we had little scrapbooks and oh, okay. everybody signed and <laughs> said something. Uh, generous and kind, although the porn star, the the candidate for the income tax deductible lap dances was not there. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure a lot of people regretted that. So where can people find you? Because you're still writing columns now on immigration. Where should people look? I mean, we'll put links in the show notes, but where are you? Where can they find you now? Okay, well, we are now the Institute for Sound Public Policies. So right. that would be 
ifspp.org, and my columns are appear there. Right. The columns are also on Substack, and they are also syndicated nationally through Kegel. So you can where where you will get the easiest access to the latest information would be by going to the ISFPP.org <laughs> website. That's okay. the new organization. We have Project for Immigration Reform under that umbrella. We have U.S. tech workers. Right. We have doctors without jobs. So there's a host of inter- information, a wealth of information on, on that website. Interesting. And yeah. one thing, Mark, yeah. that is really good, when you're on the immigration beat, you never have to say, gee, what am I going to write about today? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that never happens. I mean, unlike other guys who say, God, what's go-? not in our case. Right. That's for sure. There's always something coming up. So, so how many years, I mean, we're going to finish up now. So how many years have you been writing the column now? You've been writing it. It's not full 35 years, right? Because at first you were just getting well, in, inaugurated into the issue. To, I'm going to say at least 30. Wow. Okay. Well, actually, actually more than 33. Wow, wow. Okay, interesting. Is there some kind of a gold watch or something? Yeah, well, I'm, way I don't know. I don't, uh, I, not, <laughs> I'm not getting it either. I mean, I've been doing this for quite a while myself. So um, yeah. if there's a gold watch, I'll keep my eye out for it. Well, it's been great to exchange ideas and thoughts with you, Mark. And I've enjoyed all of your podcasts, and you do a really great job. And keeping it moving along and keeping it interesting for all of your listeners. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, Joe Gazzardi has been our guest this episode. He is an activist and writer and columnist on the immigration issue and has been for well over 30 years. And this was a good, a good conversation. I actually had forgotten that you had run for governor in the recall, and there were some good stories there. So I appreciate it, Joe. And it's been fun. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. And finally, I wanted to uh, talk about something that happened this week. It happens all the time, but it's something that we shouldn't just allow to pass without comment. The Biden administration announced the extension, the renewal of so-called temporary protected status for more than 300,000 illegal aliens, specifically those from El Salvador, Honduras, Nepal, and Nicaragua. Temporary protected status was made up by Congress to give the president a lawful way to let illegal immigrants temporarily stay here if there was some disaster back in their home country that made it impossible for them to return or be deported. The problem is, as in every one of these immigration programs, if you give the executive an inch, they'll take a mile, and here they'll take a light year. There are, according to the Congressional Research Service, well over 400,000 illegal aliens from, what is it now, 12, 13 different countries who have this so-called temporary protected status. And of those, more than 300,000 were renewed, and they weren't just renewed. These were grants of temporary protected status for illegals from the four countries I mentioned that the Trump administration was attempting to not end, but allow them to expire because they're usually granted for 12 to 18 months. And all the Trump administration was trying to do was to say the conditions that warranted temporary protected status initially have ended. And so when the time period of the, uh, of this grant ends, that they should be allowed to expire. And the key issue here is that Not only are illegal immigrants with TPS protected from deportation, but most importantly, they have work permits. That's the key issue. And because of that, they get social security numbers, driver's licenses, the whole thing. If it was just a question of not deporting somebody because there was an earthquake in their home country, ICE can just make that decision now. I mean, they just, you know, obviously if the airport's closed, nobody goes back. And then when things change, then they resume normal operations. The work permit is the key to TPS. It is TPS. And, you know, the four countries mentioned, El Salvador had an earthquake in 2001, 
and these are illegal immigrants. The bulk of them are from El Salvador, almost a quarter million, who have been here now for over 20 years on this so-called temporary status. Honduras and Nicaragua had a hurricane, Hurricane Mitch. This is, again, more than 20 years ago. And from Nepal, the people there were granted temporary protected status also because of an earthquake there. The fact is hurricanes and earthquakes happen everywhere. And if TPS is to be kept in law, it's, it's got to have some kind of automatic end date. It can't just be renewed over and over again because as far as I know, only two countries or illegals from only two countries have had their TPS end. One of them was Liberia, and there was a, it, was, it was not just a handful of people. I forget the number, but they were instantly, when TPS ended, I believe it was under the Bush, George W. Bush administration, they were granted the equivalent of TPS called DED, Deferred Enforced Departure. It's the same thing. They kept their work permits, so they actually didn't lose their TPS. The only group, as far as I can tell, were the handful of illegal immigrants, and I think it was literally just a single or double-digit number, from the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean, which had a volcanic explosion. And I think that there was no one left who even had TPS because they'd all either gotten married or they'd moved to Britain or something else. So there has never been any grant of TPS, a significant one to any significant number of people that has ended. The way I like to put it, and people understand this, they, they get the sense of this immediately, is that there's nothing as permanent as a grant of temporary protected status. And the Biden administration has simply confirmed that fact. Congress is going, next time it deals with immigration in a significant way, they're going to have to fix TPS. Some of the proposals that have been floated are to allow a president to grant TPS, but only one time and that any renewals would have to be approved by a majority vote in both houses of Congress. That way, you know, it doesn't just get to be on autopilot, where the administration just issues another notice in the Federal Register and everybody just keeps going on as before. But in one way or another, this needs to be fixed. The temporary protected status is a scandal. It is indicative of how unserious our immigration policy is. And this week's uh, extension of temporary protected status to people from countries where the conditions that warranted that grant initially have passed, not just years ago, but decades ago in many cases, really does highlight the need to fix this ridiculous aspect of our ridiculous immigration policy. That's it for this week. This is Mark Krikorian, Executive Director of the Center for Immigration Studies, signing off from Parsing Immigration Policy. If your podcast platform allows you to rate or review the podcast, I encourage you to do so. And if you have any questions, comments, criticisms, what have you, feel free to email us at center at cis.org. Thanks a lot. <laughs>